boys. Today, we're going to be participating in Ludwig Jam, hosted by Ludwig and Automated. If you don't know what a game jam is, it's this event where a bunch of game developers come together to make a game within a set time limit according to a given theme. You may ask yourself, what's the theme? Well, it's Fadian Games which are games made by Bennett Foddy, well, or similar to, games like Jump King, Quop, Getting Over It, Pogo Stuck, you know the vibes. What's the time limit, you may ask? It's 10 days. Plenty of time. So what are we going to do? Well, it's simple, really. We're going to come up with a good game idea. We're going to brainstorm the mechanics. We're going to prototype the game. We're going to program the game. We're going to write all the dialogue. We're going to design the UI. We're going to draw art for everything in the game. We're going to animate that art. We're going to make sounds and music. We're going to animate the UI. We're going to make a main menu, a victory, and a game over screen. And finally, we're going to make sure that the game actually works. Now the problem is, is that I haven't done half of those things before. But I mean, how hard can it be? I'm finished. Uh-oh, we've got a disclaimer. Today contains most of the really boring planning phase. If you don't like that, please skip ahead to the next day. On the day the game jam began, I woke up about 30 minutes after Ludwig announced the existence of the event on stream, so I was a little late to the party. I learned of the theme and had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. Foddy and games are kind of antithetical to game design, so it's really hard to come up with a good idea, in my opinion. I didn't want to just yoink and twist from an existing successful game, I wanted to do something unique. I was scrolling my Steam library for inspiration, and I was about to give up until I saw... If there is any real-life equivalent to a Fadian game, it has to be dating, so I decided on trying to make a Fadian dating simulator. After thinking about it for a good while, I thought up a game where you're on a date and you need to ask the girl questions. She responds to what you ask, and you need to remember what you've talked about. Essentially, it's a memory game, but with the dating simulator aesthetic. After discussing my game idea with a friend, he suggested that the girl also intermittently asks for your attention and you have to interact with her, otherwise you lose. I wasn't entirely sold on this idea as a game, but it was unique and I had fun plans for the art. I drew out what I wanted the UI to look like, and I made some quick assets in Photoshop to use for the prototype. Here's what the sketch looked like, and here's what the prototype in Unity looks like. It was at this point that I formalized the game mechanics. The game will have two main mechanics, asking and talking. You first ask her questions, and then you talk to her about what she told you. When asking questions, you must avoid bad date questions, as well as avoid asking the same question twice. The talk dialogue options will include slightly incorrect versions of what she told you, as well as what you have talked about before. Every set of options will only have one correct option. If you try to talk without knowing something new, you lose as you have nothing to talk about. And lastly, I wanted a timer to stress the player out. After the prototype UI was finished, I spent the rest of the day implementing UI functionality such as detecting mouse clicks on certain elements, as well as implementing the first fail state, which is talking without any knowledge. I spent a lot of time thinking about a good way to implement the first system, which is asking questions, and I realized that this whole concept is way more complicated than I initially thought. How do I know when a player is asking or talking? How do I know when a player should be picking what to say or choosing to talk or ask a question? How can I prevent the player from doing anything while the characters are talking to each other? How do I even generate the first six options? I realized that I needed more of a plan in terms of the mechanical framework instead of just winging it. 
I sketched out a class diagram which ended up looking like so. The state manager handles user input and knows if the game is waiting for input. When talking or asking, the state manager informs the options manager which mechanic has been chosen and asks the questions class or the knowledge class to generate options accordingly. And then the options manager sends this info to the dialog manager which populates the dialog boxes and informs the state manager when it is finished. When an option has been chosen, the state manager informs the options manager which was chosen and validates that the option was the correct one. Then it does several game state updates such as keeping track of knowledge learned, questions asked, and what was talked about. Then it sends the conversational dialogue to the dialogue manager so that the characters can converse and the game can continue. With a plan in place, I stubbed out all the classes and then got the overall class dependencies in place. I also got a little typewriter animation effect implemented for when dialogue is being displayed. I began day two by implementing the ability to choose a dialogue option. It was a little hard to figure out, but basically, the options manager holds on to all of the current options, and then when the state manager detects a click on the option box, it determines which number box it was, and then that is passed to the options manager and used as an index for the array of options. Additionally, I didn't want the player to be able to spam click input to mess everything up, so the state manager disables itself until the dialog manager finishes its job. The problem with that though is the dialog manager has no job yet, so I needed to implement the conversational dialog. Since the options manager knows the asked question, we send that question to the girl class and query her hash table of responses to get what she says in response. We send that question in response to the dialog manager, which then fills out the respective dialog boxes and informs the state manager that it is finished and the game can continue. Also, whenever a question is asked, it is added to a set of asked questions, so when a player chooses a question, the options manager checks if the question has been asked before, and if it has, the player loses. Now, the player can ask questions, but it doesn't actually mean anything, so the next task is to hold on to what you learned from the question. When the girl gives her response to a question, she also gives you a second item, which is like a knowledge keyword. For example, if she says she likes music, then the keyword is music. The options manager tells the knowledge manager that we learned that she likes music, and now when we choose the talk option, we can talk to her about why she likes music. This dialogue is then added to a set similar to the asked questions set, so if you talk about the same thing twice, you lose. All right. Now is the part where I explain the very complicated knowledge system. Every single knowledge keyword belongs to a category. Each category is its own set. The categories I initially wrote are hobbies, attributes, media, future goals, accomplishments, and vacations. There are three copies of these sets. The master sets, which contain all the respective keywords. The known sets, which contain only known keywords. And the unknown sets, which contain everything that hasn't been learned yet. The master sets are used for filtering the keywords when generating talking points. The unknown sets are used for generating random incorrect options. And the known sets are used for generating the correct talking option. These keywords are separated into different sets because it determines which sentence is generated. For example, for example, if the keyword is making music, then it belongs to the hobby set, and the corresponding sentence would be, you like making music? Another example is the movie Drive, which belongs to the media set. The corresponding sentence would be, what do you like about Drive? So, with the bare bones knowledge system implemented, we can now generate six talking options, five of which are random or already talked about, one of which is correct. But how do I know which talking option is correct? Questions are easy because it's only wrong if it's already been talked about, but I don't have that luxury with the talking points. I chose to do the simple solution, which is have the option manager hold on to which option is correct, and if the number doesn't match up, then the player loses. 
I unfortunately had to go to work this day, so I did not get a lot done. Currently, the questions manager has six dummy questions that are always used every time, but obviously I don't want the final game to be like this, so I needed to write a system that draws random questions from a pool and presents them to the player. This is pretty simple, honestly. It's just a set of questions that I randomly sample from. Asked questions are removed from the pool and added to the already asked pool. So now that we have a bunch of questions written, we need to write all of the responses for the girl, but that's for tomorrow. It's dialogue day, everybody. The last time I wrote dialogue was probably in my sixth grade writing class. To explain how the dialogue system in my game works, it starts with an asked question. This question queries the girl's response table and out comes her response to the question and what you learned from it. This learned keyword is then used again later to once again query her response table so that you can get an additional line of dialogue related to it. Additionally, for much needed gameplay variance, I wanted each question to have multiple possible responses so that in different playthroughs she will say different things to the same question. This means that I need to write a whole lot of questions and responses and further responses I proceeded to spend the next 14 hours writing dialogue. In the end, I had 41 questions, 104 total question responses, and an additional 104 responses to those respective keywords for a total of 249 lines of dialogue. I ended up using my own personal taste and experiences for the questions, if you couldn't tell, so this game is kind of like an ace roll a dating simulator. It's UI day, everybody! With the main mechanic of the game essentially finished, apart from specific fail conditions and the overall win condition, it's time we started making the game look better, which is my specialty. <laughs> I've never designed a UI before, so I sketched out some different ideas on paper and ended up with this one that I really liked. In particular, I really wanted the girl dialogue box to be this big speech bubble that is ever present. The old prototype sketch had four input options, but as you know, we only have the two now, talking and asking, which will go in the bottom right. In the top right, we'll have the timer and the progress the player has made in terms of time, and the majority of the screen will be taken up by all the dialogue options. After messing around in Photoshop for a bit, my final draft UI ended up looking like this. I referenced World of Horror for the most part, as it is my favorite one-bit style game. As you can see, I expanded the options to include 8 instead of 6, since I thought 6 was too easy. You may also notice that the Ask button has been replaced with a Leave button, and that's because while testing the game last night, I realized that the game was really fucking easy with the two mechanics separated. I plan to combine talking and asking into one big mechanic, in which sometimes there are new questions, and sometimes there are options to talk about what you know. With the UI complete, I also got to work on the background art of the girl portrait area. I've worked a lot with dither effects before, so I'm very familiar with dither patterns and pixel art, but this is the first time I've done any real pixel art. I hate to break it to you guys, but my art assets are in fact paint overs. I'm not skilled enough yet to draw stuff from imagination. I went and looked for stock images of restaurant backgrounds, and I found this one. Then I shoved it into Photoshop, and I painted over it for several hours until I got this together. I didn't really know what to do with the window, so I left it black for now. I imported these finished assets into Unity, and I repositioned everything so that it would work with the new UI frame. Additionally, the font looks so icky and bad with the UI aesthetic. So I imported a personal favorite font of mine, Terminus, and I think it fits quite well. 
I spent the rest of the night reworking my game's code in order to combine the talking and asking mechanics. Whenever the player talks, Unity's random number generator is used to determine a lot of what you're presented with, which could be a new question, or talking about what you've learned, it could be incorrect talking points, or it could be already asked questions or things you've already talked about, but there's still always one correct option. I didn't finish it entirely this night, but I got it working. Today was the day that I was dreading the most. The day I draw the main focal point of the game, the girl herself. I was not confident I could draw an appealing portrait whatsoever, especially in pixel art. The girl portrait was a paint over just like the background. I found this stock image of a straight faced girl and ended up with this as a final result after a few hours of work. I wanted the girl to be animated so she didn't look stiff, so I drew her with her eyes closed, and I also raised her eyebrows a bit and opened her mouth to mimic talking with interest. Lastly, I made a little frowny face for when the player loses. She looks a little bit like Ludwig with how her right eye is one pixel above her left. I imported her into Unity and positioned her properly on the screen. I also finally cropped out and made images for the buttons and positioned them on the screen as well, so I didn't have to use these very bad looking talk or ask prototype images. Additionally, I made a little custom cursor texture, so I can say that I did. It's basically just a bigger version of the default Windows cursor. With the UI finalized, I started on animating it so it's more usable and reactive to the user's actions. This was done by creating two extra textures for the dialogue options, the talk button, and the leave button. The first extra texture was one that is displayed when you hover over the UI element, and the other extra texture is one to visualize that the element is disabled. The way this works is that Unity provides a function called onMouseOver, which executes when the mouse hovers over it. When this function is called, we change the texture of the object to the hover texture. Unity provides another function called onMouseExit, which we can use for changing the texture back to normal. For the disable texture, I had the state manager object enable and disable game objects accordingly to inform the player what is interactable and what is not. Lastly, when we hover over an interactable, we change the mouse cursor to inform the player that you can click on it to do something. The next thing I did today was learn how Unity animation works. I won't bog you with the specifics, but Unity has really nice tools for animators and it didn't take me long at all to learn how it works. Essentially, the animator holds on to flags that you can enable and disable to transition between animations. When the girl is talking, I set the talking flag to true and she starts talking until I disable it. There are also evergreen animations, ones that are always happening. Her blink, for example, is always running, regardless of if she is talking or angry. This required me to separate her eyes from her face, and while that looks kind of creepy here, you don't see that in the game itself. With her animations finished, it was finally time for me to implement the visual feature I've been waiting on, and that's the portrait parallax. I wanted your mouse pointer to represent your attention in the game world. When you're mousing over the dialogue options, it's like you're looking to the left, and when you mouse to the right, it's like you're looking out the window. Here's the code for it. I used some code someone else wrote and modified it to suit my needs. Basically, the portrait moves relative to the mouse with some damping and boundaries to prevent the portrait from accidentally going too far and revealing the void. Moving on, one aspect of World of Horror I really, really like is that it has many different color schemes that you can either randomize or choose from manually. I wanted to have this in my own game as well, and it's very easy to do since all our assets are black and white. We start with an empty camera script and an image effect shader. We run the shader on our final render before it is displayed to the screen, and in that shader, we sample the render and we use its luminance value as an interpolator between two colors, those two colors being our color scheme. 
Since our luminance is either 0 or 1, we only get one of the two colors, and nothing gross in between. This shader allows us to color our game any way we want, and I ended up making about 20 different color schemes. The last thing I did today was fix something that was bothering me with the dialogue. Currently, the dialogue gets animated at a constant rate, but that's not how a real conversation flow works. In real life, we pause on punctuation, so I wanted the dialogue animation to pause for a longer period of time on commas, periods, and other punctuation. I think this improves the readability of the dialogue as it is being animated, and helps information absorption. Also, I normalized the option box fill rate so that all the options finish filling at the exact same time. It's audio day, everybody! This was the day I was actually dreading the most, as I had at least some idea how to do pixel art, but I have absolutely no idea how to do sound design. I wanted to have similar audio to games like Phoenix Wright and Papers, Please. After digging around, I found this amazing program called BFXR, which is perfect for creating short and simple waveform sounds. I made a sound for the player talking, a slightly higher pitched version for the girl talking, and a sound for when the player clicks on something. I imported these into Unity, and then played the click sound when you click on something, and then I played the dialogue sounds when the text was being animated. Next, I started thinking about potential game music. I've never made music, I have no idea how to make music, and I don't even have a program to make it with other than using Adobe Audition to splice clips together. I thought for a long time until I remembered a vision I had a few years ago. It was an ambient art piece in which unnamed characters are lounging around in a living room while it's raining outside. No words, just depressing vibes. I still had not done anything with the window in game, so I thought having it raining outside would be perfect combined with a noise-based ambient background noise. I learned that Audacity has the ability to generate noise, so I layered brown, pink, and white noise on top of each other, and I intermittently wobbled the base of the white noise to simulate heavy wind or thunder or whatever. I feel like it turned out really great for something I have never made before and I only made in a few minutes. The idea was to capture the vibe of restaurant noise ambience, combined with the sounds of rain outside but muffled by the indoors. Here's a quick clip of it. I imported this into Unity, and now it just plays automatically when the game starts and loops. Pretty simple. Currently, we have rain ambiance, but we have no rain. I went into Photoshop and I put together a two-frame rain animation and put those into Unity. The rain animation now plays in the background automatically, and it moves with the mouse just like the portrait so it stays aligned. With this, the main game is essentially completed. We have the bare bones game flow implemented, the art and animations are all there, as well as the sound design. I wanted to finish up the dialogue option generation, but it was still missing one piece, which is bad date questions. I created a set of a bunch of bad questions, such as how much do you weigh, or are you an alcoholic? These bad questions will intermittently show up to confuse the player, since it's a question they haven't seen before, but they have to determine if the question will end the date or not. After implementing the bad questions, I finished up option generation such that now the game can go on forever, or at least until the game runs out of questions. Going on forever isn't that great. The game should end eventually. I created a text box to visualize the time in the top right. I also added a box for the date just as flavor. I decided that each successful action will increment time by 5 minutes, and the game will end at 8 o'clock. 
This means that 36 successful actions must be made in order to win, which is a lot, but the first 8 actions will be functioning as the tutorial anyways, so it's more like 28 successful actions. I finished out the night by coming up with a name for the game, as well as designing the main menu. The tentative name was Seed of Sacrifice, as a reference to the trial from Final Fantasy XIV, as well as a funny joke about dating. I asked a friend for help, and we came up with The Dating Game, as a funny play on words, and reference to the 1960s show by the same name. Please don't sue me. The main menu design isn't anything special, as by this point I was very tired and exhausted. I imported it into Unity and implemented the UI functionality in the same way as the main game UI. Today started off with being unhappy with my color scheme system. I liked that it was randomized on start, but I wanted the player to have some control over it. I put in a little button in the top right, and when clicked, it cycles through color schemes. The game was still lacking a victory and game over screen, so I took the main menu design and then changed the text to reflect victory and game over respectively. Then I duplicated the main menu scene twice and switched the background to the proper screens. It's pretty lazy, but it works. At this point, the game was finished. You can win, you can lose properly, the option generation is implemented, and there's no bugs. After playtesting for a while, I felt that the dialogue in general felt very unnatural and mechanical, like it was obvious that the talking points were being automatically generated from one keyword, so to fix this, I ditched my entire system. I hand wrote custom inquiries for every single knowledge keyword, which means there's another 104 lines of dialogue in the game. Additionally, the incorrect talk options were too obvious, so I created a custom incorrect version of every single knowledge keyword, which means there is now another 104 lines of dialogue. When a keyword is learned, its incorrect version is added to the pool of potential incorrect options. For example, if you ask her what her favorite band is, and she says always, the incorrect version of this is always but with a W. Quite dubious, if I do say so myself. With this change, I was much happier with the dialogue, and I think that it also made the game much harder, which is great! I also made it so that the options slowly fill with each new talk to slowly introduce the player to the game mechanic. The first option of the game will always be a question, and the second talk will always be what you talked about and the incorrect version of what you talked about, so that the player knows to watch out for that trickery. That's what I call good game design. Today, I realized I forgot to inform the player how to actually win the game. I implemented some intro dialogue on Game Start, where the girl tells you that you can talk until 8 o'clock. Now the game is finished for real! Yay! Woohoo! I wanted there to be a little opening credits intro so people can really understand that I made this game and that I am very vain. I edited it together in Adobe Premiere and imported it into Unity, which plays the video on application start. This little intro ended up becoming the basis for my new intro for videos, which I like a lot. All that's left to do is all the marketing. I uploaded the game to itch.io, I put together the page for the game, and I submitted it to Ludwig Jam. Before I talk about the results of the game jam, I wanted to add a section about cut content. If you remember from the start, I wanted the girl to have a quick time event, but this didn't make it into the final game. I also wanted the girl to ask you questions herself, so it was more of a two-way conversation and less of an interrogation, which many players of my game have criticized. 
In terms of art, I wanted there to be more horror elements. I had this idea where each failure incremented a counter under the hood that would control how horrific the game got. So the more you failed, the creepier the game would get. The horror elements would be like the girl distorting or glitching out, her eyes disappearing intermittently, her dialogue getting distorted, stuff appearing outside of the window, and other stuff like that. I felt this would have really driven the aesthetic of the game further, but it would have taken way more time. People have asked me to add this stuff into the game after the fact, but I'd rather begin work on new projects and save this idea for a future game. In total, there was 155 submissions. The community voting period lasted for three days. During that time, I peaked at number two in most voted and number one most popular, which I was pretty happy about. This had no impact on whether or not I got my game on stream, but it was nice nonetheless. The way this all worked was that Otto and the other Ludwig mods handpicked 10 of the submissions to be streamed and judged, and 5 of those 10 would be deemed winners and given $2,000. The judging involved 4 main criteria, theme, presentation, originality, and gameplay. There was a lot of debate over what makes a game Fodian or not, as no one could really come up with a strict definition. Several people didn't think my game was Fodian in nature, but I like to think it was. My game was very unforgiving, it was supposed to cause information overload, and has compounding failure in the abstract sense rather than the literal sense. Each failure of my game makes later playthroughs of the same session more difficult, as you remember information from previous plays. Did she say she liked music this run, or was it last run? Did I ask this question this time, or was it last time? It was this aspect of my game that I was very proud of in concept, and I thought was a completely unique twist on the genre. The day of the judging came around, and... I was an honorable mention! Woohoo! This is a mild success for me, but I would have liked to be top 10. After a long day of judging, the final verdict and winner of the game jam was... Super Auto Pets! Congratulations to Super Auto Pets. It's an amazing game, and it deserves all the time that it gets on Ludwig's stream. In the end, I'm very proud that my game was one of a kind in both concept and presentation. My work stood up there with games that were made by teams of four. There was plenty of amazing submissions and every winner deserved it wholeheartedly. I can't help but feel I could have done more, but I spent every waking moment of my life working on the game for 10 days straight, so it's hard to say. If you want to play the game or look at the code, please see the GitHub link in the description. A lot of work went into all of this, so I'd really appreciate if you subscribed and left a comment about whatever. Thankfully, it's over now and I can rest. I hope someday I am a large enough creator to host my own game jam, but until then, I've got to go, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.